Good morning. It's so good to see everyone here this morning. If you're able, please stand with us as we open our worship service with Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. to our 8 o'clock service today. I hope you guys are having a great day so far today. We're glad to uh, see each of you as we worship the Lord together. Uh, just, a, of course, a welcome to any first-time visitors. If you are a first-time visitor or first time in a long time, we do invite you to take that portion of the bulletin, our tear-off portion, called the connection card. Uh, we ask for you just to fill that out, drop in the offering plate as you leave so we can connect with you uh, and tell you how thankful we are that you are here with us today. And as always, if you have a prayer request, any other kind of need, you can fill that out, drop in the offering plate as well. Uh, just a few announcements this morning, a couple that I don't have in the bulletin. First of all, uh, we do, I do want to say thank you to everyone that came out for work day yesterday or that did some uh, different tasks through the week leading up to yesterday. Had a, had a good turnout yesterday, had a lot that came out ahead of time, uh, got a lot accomplished. So I do want to say thank you for that. Uh, there is some stuff as we just kind of cleaned out, got things uh, organized. Uh, there's some stuff in the window downstairs. So in the kitchen window, uh, like some Tupperware, some different items. So be sure if maybe you're missing something or there may be something of yours that's here, check that window before you leave today. If there's anything that's yours, be sure to take that home. Uh, otherwise, we're going to try to put it away somewhere. Uh, so we want to make sure you, you uh, have access to that. Um, also, uh, do want to just mention, some of you probably saw, uh, Friday on Facebook. We are going to begin. We actually started this morning. 
uh, posting a, of course, this is Palm Sunday today, beginning the Passion Week of Christ, which is his last week leading up to crucifixion, resurrection. So uh, we are going to be posting a different reading each day on Facebook with a couple questions just to kind of think through the passage, to reflect on it, to meditate upon it. So the first one was posted this morning. I think they're going to drop about 6 o'clock every morning. So hopefully uh, you're either up or that will be the first thing you wake up to. We want to invite everyone uh, just to participate in that. A great way for us to be uh, reflecting, meditating upon God's word as, as we get closer to uh, Good Friday and Easter. So uh, be on the lookout for those on Facebook. Uh, the announcements I have here in the bulletin, of course, youth group tonight, 530 upstairs here. Uh, tonight, downstairs, Sunday night Bible study, we're wrapping up our discussion through the book of Habits of Grace. So uh, last section there, pages, our days 28 to 31, we'll be enjoying that tonight downstairs at 6. We have our Good Friday service coming up this Friday at 6 p.m. Look forward just to a great time uh, of looking to God's word, of, of course, singing. Uh, we are going to participate in communion together as well, so something to be mindful of leading up to our Good Friday service. And then we'll have popcorn and some cookies afterward, enjoy some fellowship downstairs. Also, next Sunday, of course, is our Easter Sunday. Uh, we haven't really made any announcements about what that's going to look like, and that's simply because it's going to be very normal uh, to what we've been doing. We're going to have an 8 o'clock, just like normal, a 10 o'clock. We don't want to try to cram everyone in here for one service, uh, so we will have basically things as normal. 8 a.m., there will not be uh, formal child care provided, but 10 a.m., we'll have nursery and children's church. Uh, and and one, one good thing about having the two services is in the past, uh, we've had the one service, and typically we don't want to ask people to do nursery. Uh, and so we've basically had open nursery in the past, but because we have those two services, now we can provide that nursery and children's church so the workers can be at the, one of the services that they're not serving in. So that's kind of a blessing uh, of just doing these two services. So next week, pretty normal, 8 a.m., 10 a.m. Hope you'll uh, come out, maybe invite a, a friend, family member to uh, celebrate the resurrection of Christ with us as well. Uh, two more quick announcements. Quarterly meeting and meals coming up. Uh, it's the first time we've announced this, but April 18th, following the 10 a.m. service, uh, we'll have a meal downstairs. Uh, it is kind of a potluck, so there's a sign-up sheet outside uh, in the foyer under the TV uh, with the different items that we need. So you can sign up for a crock pot of soup or a dozen sandwiches desserts, things like that. We do ask if you sign up for sandwiches or desserts that they're individually packaged just so that we're not having uh, a lot of people touching food, that kind of thing. And when we do the soup, we'll have servers with gloves and masks serving that as well. So it'll be a great uh, time to have that meal together followed by a, our quarterly meetings we look through uh, this first quarter of the year. Uh, the only other announcement I have there is about summer camp. Of course, we've been announcing that registration is open, but I do want to mention because we we kind of do this every year, but it's something we have to kind of approve, and so we finally got that approval as we had our board meeting. The camp is going to cover half the cost for campers that go. The church. What did I say? The camp? Yes, the church. Uh, the camp, which is charging full price, right? Uh, but the church has decided we're going to pay half the price uh, with it being $85. That'll be $42.50. So uh, if you have not paid yet, just submit $42.50 to Bethel. Uh, they'll see that that's half the price. They know we're covering the other half, so they're going to hold your spot once they get that half. If you have already paid the full 85, let Pastor Justin or myself know, and we'll be sure to get that other half reimbursed to you uh, since it is a little bit of a delay that we finally approve that. But we want to put that out there. If you, if you know of any kids that maybe were on the fence about it with the cost it going up a little bit, great incentive for them to go for, for just 42 bucks for the whole week of camp. All right. The only other thing I'd point out, uh, VBS, of course, uh, I got the sign up out there. This will probably be the last Sunday I leave that out there. So be sure if you have not signed up and you'd like to help with VBS uh, to do that by today uh, so we can start kind of put plugging people in and that kind of thing. All right. Let us go ahead. Uh, we're going to pray, and then we'll turn our attention to our call to worship. So let's pray, and then we're going to look at Romans 8, verses 18 through 28. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for another morning that we can gather. We thank you for the freedom that we have to do so. Uh, thank you for all the faces that are here uh, bright and early, ready to uh, worship you together, to uh, hear from your word. And, and Lord, I pray that it would be our, all of our desires to apply what we learn to our lives, to live it out to your glory. Lord, just help us even now to quiet our hearts, to 
uh, remove any distractions uh, in life, that we would just be able to, to fully focus upon you, to fully devote ourselves to worshiping and praising you uh, through this, this hour or so that we have together. So Lord, just be glorified in our midst today. Uh, we pray for encouragement for those who may be struggling today, whatever situations of life they may be going through, that today they would, they would leave here encouraged and strengthened and, and edified by uh, one another as we seek to, to be that mutual encouragement. So Lord, just be honored in our, our time together today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship today comes from Romans 8, 18 through 28. Very familiar passage. But we'll read this together. It says, Paul, of course, writing, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit help, helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. We read verse 28 many times, and we see that that promise that for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. And sometimes we can be tempted to think these verses are referring to earthly good, that God is promising that we're going to be delivered from whatever sickness, whatever trial, struggle that we're going through here and now. And, of course, the Lord does that, and he's magnified in that. But many times this good is just our ultimate good, the fact that, we can praise the Lord through our suffering, that we can glorify him even as we're going through a challenging time, that that can be an encouragement to another believer. And our ultimate good is, of course, if we've trusted Christ by faith, we know we are secure. That even if cancer or a car accident or whatever it may be takes our life, if we're trusting him, if we're praising him, that that is ultimately good because our trust, our hope is in Christ, not just in this life. Uh, I wanted to read a quote as well that I, I found kind of interesting this week from a man named Herbert Schlossberg. He said this, The Bible can be interpreted as a string of God's triumphs disguised as disasters. We know ultimately that God will triumph, and he is triumphing. Even when life looks like a disaster, even when things aren't going the way we would hope, we know ultimately he will triumph and has triumphed through Christ. And so... With that in mind, I want us to sing this next set of songs uh, with just the focus. Whatever you may be struggling with, going through, that even in those times of trial, we can trust the Lord, we can praise Him, we can magnify His name, and His, His name is made known. The gospel goes out as we do this. So let's stand together as we sing 10,000 Reasons. <laughs>
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name.
Father God, as we just stand here this morning and I read through this psalm, for all my days, yes, I will. Father, I just pray this morning that we let that just kind of sink in. As we go through our day, we go through our weeks, we see so many things pass before us. And unfortunately, we don't take time to let you sink in. And Father, I pray this morning that we'll choose to praise, to glorify the name above all names, so that we come amidst adversity or challenges, that you would lead us in spirit and truth, and that we would be the reflection that you'd have us to be, so that those around us would see something that's different. And it wouldn't be us. It would be you working through us. Father, I just pray this morning that the message you've laid on the pastor's heart will just speak to us. Father, we look forward to the resurrection. Father, there are so many things we're thankful for. So many times we think we're not worthy for anything. But you come right alongside us and give us a great big hug. And Father, I thank you for that. And this morning I ask that you just hide the pastor behind the cross. Let him preach the word that you've given him given us. And Father, we'll just give you all the praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. It took us 10 months to preach the book of Ephesians. And I was uh, talking with actually my old senior pastor when we lived in Illinois. And uh, I had said something about how we'd been in Ephesians since June 1st of last year, and he laughed at me, and he said, what have you been doing? And, um, you know, just kind of making our way through it, and uh, we're going to bring it to a close this morning. Ten months later, we're going to finish Ephesians, and uh, it's kind of crazy, really, when you think about it, right? Because it's only six chapters. It's a relatively uh, short book, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I would not go back and do it over. To go through it slowly, in some cases, a verse at a time. Uh, some cases, four or five verses, but in some instances, just one verse a week. And I trust that uh, you, you would say that the book of Ephesians has been helpful. Um, there's no doubt that uh, there's some pretty uh, relevant, I mean, it's all relevant, but, you know, sometimes some scripture seems a little more relevant than others, given the, uh, our lives and the current events of our lives and things of that nature. And, and I believe that Ephesians uh, fits well into that category. And uh, so I trust that you have found navigating Ephesians uh, beneficial and, and helpful, and I pray that uh, you, would be, you would have not only been challenged, um, but that as we're going to see this morning, you would have been encouraged. And this is Paul's final encouragement, is what we're calling this today, as Paul brings this letter to a close. I know that you all just sat down, but I'm going to ask you if you would humor me one more time if you're able. This will be the last time I'll ask you to do it before we're finished, but if you'll stand with me or with Roger, he was already up. Uh, if you'll stand with Roger, we will read our, our text together this morning. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose. That you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Let's pray as we begin. Father, I'm thankful this morning for the encouragement that the Word of God brings. And I'm thankful, God, that of all the ways Paul could have ended his letter to the church at Ephesus, he ended it by seeking to bring encouragement to them. And God, I pray this morning, whether we've been, whether those who are here today or perhaps watching on our live stream, God, whether they've been with us through the whole journey of Ephesians or maybe today is the first time uh, that they're, they're opening to the pages of Ephesians 6 with us, I pray, God, that we would find encouragement. I pray that we might see the heart of the apostle, uh, God, that we might see 
on just the reality of why he was so faithful in doing what he did. God, as it was a reflection of your faithfulness to him, God, and your faithfulness to us. And so this morning we pray that we would be encouraged, but we pray, God, that you would remind us and, and cultivate in our hearts a reality of understanding and knowing that encouragement is found only as we fix our eyes upon the Savior. So, God, I pray this morning that you would give us those eyes to see, that we would look to Jesus uh, as he has presented himself, not as we want him to be or not what we think he should be, but, God, may we look at Jesus this morning. Uh, may we look at your word this morning for the way that you have given your son and your word to us, that we might see each of them for what they are and that we might allow you and your Holy Spirit to work through our lives to conform us into the image of your son that you've called us to. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It is good to be back. Uh, I was thinking this morning when we were singing, it's actually been three weeks since I preached, which seems like an eternity. And uh, it's amazing kind of how you will feel so out of the loop and out of the flow of doing the the regular activities of, you know, what you do uh, by way of being a pastor. But as I say often, uh, actually every time I'm out of the pulpit for any reason, uh, I, I'm so thankful for Pastor Aaron and uh, just his faithfulness to open the Word of God. I'm super thankful for Kevin. I know for many of you, uh, two Sundays ago was, well, I guess it would have been three Sundays and now two, I don't know, a couple weeks back, a few weeks back, uh, Kevin uh, continued right where I left off in Ephesians and opened the Word and and, uh, and he brought it to the body, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for his willingness to study. Um, you know, there is a, a dynamic where Aaron and I are expected to do that, right? And, uh, and, and we seek to do it faithfully, but I'm so thankful for uh, individuals in the church, men and women alike, but especially in the case of a few Sundays ago, Pastor, or Pastor Kevin, Kevin's willingness to um, open the word and uh, to, to study it and to bring it to us. And so I trust that you guys were encouraged by both of those men as they brought the word to you over the last couple weeks. But as we consider back to last week, as Pastor Aaron called us to the reality of the believer's need to stand firm, there is no doubt a war that is being waged. It's a war that on the surface you don't see. It's a war that we've talked a lot about through Ephesians. You might recall back in Ephesians chapter 2, we talked about this reality where the Apostle Paul spoke of those who are not in Christ are dead in their trespasses and sins. And so we understand, hopefully we're at least growing in our understanding if we don't understand, that our, our, our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's not with the people that we don't agree with or the people that do things differently than we do or don't do what we think they should do. If those folks don't know Christ, the word of God is clear. They're dead. They're walking zombies. And, and they, th there's this war that is being waged that the Apostle Paul says believers must be aware of. And furthermore, we must be mindful of it. And we must understand that it is the most important battle you will fight. The spiritual war that exists between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And it's so great, in fact, that God has given us at our disposal, in his grace and in his mercy, what we need to fight that war. Because as Pastor Aaron showed us, or reminded us, walked us through last week, maybe showed some of us, maybe reminded some of us, Ephesians 6.10 is what? Be strong. Where? Who? In the Lord and in the power of his might. We can't fight the battle on our own. And so Pastor Aaron, he reminds us of this. He called it the empowerment. How it is that we are empowered to fight the battle. It's understanding that the strength to fight comes from God. And the exhortation was to put on what God has given you to fight the battle, the whole armor of God. And then Pastor Aaron walked us through these elements of the armor. And we don't have time to go back and unpack all of that tonight. If you, uh, if you missed that last week, it is on our live stream or our, our YouTube. I'd encourage you to go back and, 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 and check that out in light of what we're gonna, where we're going to pick up today. And so where we picked up in verse 18, it's actually really kind of the middle of the thought. 
right? So Paul finishes as he's working through 17. He says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And that's where Pastor Aaron stopped. And then in verse 18, Paul continues and he says, praying at all times in the spirit. And this is where we want to begin looking at this morning is this reality of praying at all times in the spirit. And as we pick up our conversation here this morning, this will take us through the end of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And it's interesting because I think we want to be mindful as much as we pick up in verse 18 where Paul speaks to the responsibility, or we're going to call it this morning, we'll see in a minute, the requirement of believers to pray. But, but you, you see that it's closely connected to the battle that's being waged. But I also believe that there's an element of looking back over the course of everything that Paul has said to the church in Ephesus as he brings this letter to a close. And so we're going to unpack some of that this morning as well. And so Paul begins this final encouragement, as we've noted already, in verses 18 through 20, with the requirement of believers. The requirement of believers. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me, and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Believers are reminded once again of the importance of prayer in the spiritual battle. Now, we should not view this exhortation to pray as an additional element of the armor. It's not. It's not another element of the armor. But it's, it, and we even want to be careful to say that prayer is the means whereby we put on the armor. There's, there's some, uh, some room there where I think that we can say that that's a practical application, right? Because it is through prayer that we grow in the understanding of our salvation. It is through prayer that we better understand the Word of God as we work through it. So prayer plays a vital role. And so Paul calls these believers, and by way of the Ephesian believers, us as well, to pray. And he speaks first to the rea reality of how it is that they should pray. He says they should pray at all times. This is similar to what Paul would tell the church at Thessalonica in chapter 5, verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians, that they are to pray without ceasing. This doesn't mean that every moment of our lives is spent in this state of prayer where we're doing nothing but just praying and praying and praying and praying. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is calling believers to <clears throat> is a readiness to pray. That at any point in your life, something could arise or you could become aware of a, of a need or a situation or maybe you endure a temptation and you need to be ready to pray at all times. Quick to engage in the action of prayer. The action of prayer, I will remind you, is on the basis or is given to us on the basis of who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished. In Hebrews chapter 4, I, I reference it often. It's one of those verses where I feel like I, sometimes I think, man, I reference that all the time. But you, you, you can never really go wrong referencing Hebrews chapter 4 where it talks about because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done, we as believers have direct access to the Father. <clears throat> we have the ability in any situation, it's a drop of a hat in a moment's notice at all times to be able to enter into the throne room of God through the action of prayer because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Paul says believers are to pray at all times. Be ready to pray. Be ready to pray. He also says not only do you pray at all times, but, but pray in the spirit. And this is, we don't, we don't want to overblow this, right? Like it's not a super fanciful thing. It is the Spirit, even you consider what Pastor Aaron read for us in our call to worship in Romans 8, 18 to 28 today. This reality of the Spirit working in us, in, 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 uh, uh, enabling us to pray, helping us to know what to pray and, and how to pray. But as we pray and as we're on the ready to pray, the reality is our goal and our desire is to pray in accordance with the will of God. To pray in accordance 
to what it is that the Spirit would be working in us or in the situation that we're praying for. And sometimes we don't know what that looks like, right? Sometimes our prayer is as simple in the Spirit as, God, we need you, or we're asking that you would work in this situation to the good of the situation, the individuals, whatever it may be, God, and to your glory, in accordance to your will. I'm going to tell you right now, when you don't know how to pray, just go there. When you don't know how to pray, but you pray in the spirit, desiring for God's will to come to fruition and for his name to be magnified and glorified, if you just pray to that end, I would submit to you this morning that you're faithfully praying in the spirit. Praying in accordance to the will of God. He also says here that they are to pray with supplication. Pray seeking to see God meet needs. In some cases our own, in some cases it's others. He says with alertness and perseverance. That, that kind of fits into that at all times. There's an alertness. There's a, a readiness to pray. And, and, and if I could be honest with you, when I think of this reality of being alert when it comes to prayer, it's almost more of a, I think of this in, in my own life, in a situation, and maybe you can relate to this, where there may be a temptation for sin or for something that is different or outside of the norm or it's questionable and you're navigating, you're not sure what to do or how to, pr how to proceed, Paul's saying, be alert. And in those situations, you know, I, I make no bones about it. One of the things that, that I talk often about, you know, with men is the things that men are taking in with their eyes. And we talk about this reality. This is, this is an example of being alert and being watchful. I'm saying this, if I go this path, it's sinful and it's destructive. So being alert is first recognizing that it's sinful and it's destructive. So we're being alert. We pray with perseverance. Because you know, sometimes it's hard to stay on alert. Sometimes it's hard to stay rooted and pray with perseverance. See, when we put these things together, what we wind up with here is a recipe for defending ourselves against the schemes of the devil, as Pastor Aaron introduced us to last week. It's not, and, I, and, and you know, I probably shouldn't even use the word recipe. It makes it sound like there's a magical formula. Oh, if you do this, then you won't you won't fall victim to the devil. No, there's not a magic recipe, but I will let you in on what may be a secret for some of us. It's not really a secret because it's written right in the pages of Scripture very clearly. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So draw near to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But you got to understand that we resist the devil by putting on the whole armor of God. It's not a magical formula. It's God and his goodness saying, as Pastor Aaron reminded us last week, we are weak. Right? Like, just own it. We're weak. And we don't have the ability to resist the devil on our own strength. And so God, again, in a gentle way, reminding us of our weakness, says, then put on what I've given you, that you might resist the devil. And so again, we see this reality. Paul uses the word supplication twice for ourselves and for others. Again, don't just want to gloss over it too much, but we see this, this reality of praying with, with uh, perseverance, with alertness, supplications for ourselves and for others. And so he says who, how to pray, but then also who to pray for. And we've touched on this a little bit just kind of by way of how this unfolds. But who do you pray for? The saints. The saints. That's brothers and sisters in Christ. So we're praying for some of the things that Paul's walking through here, that we would be alert, that we would persevere, things of that nature. But, it, you know, you can pray that for other folks as well. You know, and, and I don't, you know, I don't want this to come across wrong or uh, to, to seem inappropriate, but, like, do you guys pray for Pastor Aaron and I? You pray for the elders? You pray for the deacons? You pray for the leaders of this church? If you don't, please do. 
please. I'm, I'm almost begging you to pray for us because, you know, this war is real. We recognize that. And when you think about, you know, praying for others, and sometimes it seems like, you, you know, well, there's this need or that need, and so we pray for this person or that person. Sometimes there's a, a whole, uh, you'd be in a season where it seems there's a whole bunch of specific needs, but sometimes you just can pray generally for the saints. You can just pray in a general fashion for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can always pray in a general fashion for the leadership of Dale Bible Church. That God would give us wisdom, that God would give us unity, that God would allow us to work together in a way that he would be glorified, that, that God would protect us from sin, that we would remain alert, that we would persevere. See, you can always pray for other people. And Paul says believers ought to be praying for others and for themselves. There's also a specific sense here for the church at Ephesus. We pray for ourselves. We pray for others in a general sense. But there's a specific sense here where Paul requests prayer for himself. In verse 19, he says, and also for me. So Paul says, pray for me. The words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains so that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So if you're not familiar with the context of the book of Ephesians, uh, amongst others books, other books, well, when Paul says, you know, pray for me that I would speak boldly, and he speaks of being an ambassador in chains, he's literally in prison. He's literally wearing chains and is literally attached to a Roman prison guard. <clears throat> and Paul is literally in prison, literally in chains, literally attached to a Roman guard for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. And Paul says, pray for me. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because Paul doesn't say, pray for me that they would let me out of here so that I can keep preaching. What does Paul say? Paul says, pray for me that in my chains with my new pal, let's call him, I don't know, I was trying to think of a, a Roman name off the top of my head, I couldn't come up with, so let's just call him my new Roman pal. Pray that I would have the words to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray that I would have the words to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ when I stand before the emperor of Rome and at his call, my head is chopped off. Pray that I would be bold in proclaiming the mystery of the gospel. You know, we can pray for those who are suffering for the cause of Christ. We don't pray for Paul. Paul's in glory. But there's folks all around us who are suffering for the cause of Christ. I mentioned a few weeks ago the pastor in Canada. He's been released. I don't know all the details. He was released while I was uh, away. Actually, we were on vacation. But he's back home and he's with his family. And again, I'll just tell you like I told you then. He's my age. Has two kids under 10. And he was in He was in jail. For holding church services and preaching the word of God. So we can pray. Brothers and sisters around the world are persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ today. Right now. Not in history, although it happened there too. But right now. We can pray for those who are suffering for the cause of Christ. And the reality is. <clears throat> excuse me. And we're going to unpack this a little more in a minute. But the reality is, is Paul seeks prayer from the believers. What is his greatest goal and desire? It's that God would be glorified. It's that the gospel would go forth, that people would hear and believe, and that God would be glorified. And it's in the midst of undeserved bad circumstances. You think about that. Paul's concern is the gospel. He's in a situation that stinks. And he's in a situation that stinks for doing nothing wrong. 
nowhere in any of Paul's letters do we find, woe is me. Paul never says, this is unfair. I shouldn't be going through this. Where is God? What Paul says is, pray for me. Because they moved me to this jail, and now I get to meet this guy, and all these prisoners are here, and I'm preaching to them too. Paul says, pray for me and the gospel. Pray that the gospel would go forth. And so the believer has been given a requirement to pray. It's a requirement. We ought to be praying people. It's only through prayer that we can withstand the devil. And it doesn't mean that we just, this isn't just about not falling into sin. This is about withstanding suffering for the cause of Christ. We pray for that too. Listen, I'm not much of a let's wave a white flag and be a doom and gloom kind of person, okay? But I'm also not going to stuff my head in the sand. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something. Apart from divine intervention, suffering is coming. And how well we suffer when it gets here is going to be predicated upon how well we prepare for our suffering until it gets here. I don't know what it looks like, and I don't know when it happens. But we are not special. When you read the pages of Scripture following the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, those who followed him suffered. And if you watch the news at all, listen, let me give you an example. Many of you, I don't know, you guys know I'm a big sports fan. It's March Madness, right? And um, some of you probably have seen by now that last weekend, uh, Oral Roberts University out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, while I would not agree with all of the theology and things that they would teach, they do identify as an evangelical Division I university. They made it into the NCAA tournament. Their odds were long. They were a 15 seed, and they had to play powerhouse Ohio State. Well, many of you probably know by now that Oral Roberts beat Ohio State. It was the first major upset of March Madness. And two days later, Oral Roberts would have to play. Who did Oral Roberts play next week? Where's Aaron when I need him? Florida. Florida. Yeah, thank you. I was still on vacation. Oral Roberts played Florida. And guess what? Oral Roberts beat Florida too. And so now, for the second time in NCAA history, a 15 seed is in the Sweet 16. And because the way March Madness works, there's a whole week between the round of 32, which was where they beat Florida, and the round of the Sweet 16. Whole week goes by, and, and Oral Roberts is now set to play Arkansas. They played last night. I'm going to tell you right now, unfortunately, I was rooting for them. They got beat 72-70. They probably got beat because I was rooting for them because everybody I root for loses. But anyways, um, but anyways, I don't know if you saw over the course of the last week the number of people who came out of the woodwork and went as far as to say that because Oral Roberts holds a traditional view of marriage, they shouldn't even be allowed to compete in March Madness. They should literally be kicked out of the NCAA tournament because they believe that marriage, as defined by God, is for one man and for one woman. In the media, in the talking heads, in the spiritual battle that is raging, said they shouldn't even be allowed to play basketball because we don't agree with them. It's coming. Where does it stop? I don't know. Maybe people wake up before it gets to wherever it's going now. I, I don't know. But do you realize the magnitude of some of the things that are happening? Can you fathom that in 2009 the narrative was, church, why does it matter if two men get married? It doesn't affect your beliefs. Twelve years later, we're being told our beliefs are intolerant, that they're unacceptable, and that if we hold them, we should be canceled. It does matter. And again, I don't want to be a doom and gloom. But I don't want to lead you astray either. And I'm fearful for the 
to sponsor the church in America, including ours, in suffering. None of that was in my notes. You know that part where Paul's talking about praying in the spirit? It took over. Not only do we see this requirement of believers, but Paul, for the believers in Ephesus, he, he sends a report to them. He gives a report to the believers in Ephesus. In verse 21, so that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing Take a kiss, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So we just see a reality of there's a report coming. Faithful brother. This is a man who's traveled on missionary journeys with Paul. Take a kiss, he's been by Paul's side through a lot, through thick and thin, and here he is on behalf of Paul taking this letter back to the church at Ephesus. You see, the reality for the Apostle Paul is that his desire is for the church to know how he's doing. And, and again, there's times in our lives when we suffer and the tendency is for the focus to become about us and our suffering, right? But that's not Paul's focus. Paul's focus is the church at Ephesus and that it would be encouraged and that it would be built up. And in order to be an encouragement to them, he sends them this report. And I want to pause here for a second just to kind of flesh something out that we don't, the text doesn't necessarily say, say to us here, but that it teaches us. It teaches us this reality of the church being bound together in faith. And this is why we pray for a pastor in Canada who's unjustly in jail. Because he's a part of the same body that we are. The body of Jesus Christ. Because there's a, a care and a concern for people who are going through things that we could be going through, that we could be experiencing. And so because Paul knows the church at Ephesus is praying on his behalf, they're agonizing over his state and his conditions, knowing that he's been hauled to Rome and he's awaiting death. Paul says, it ain't all bad, Ephesus. I want you to be encouraged. And isn't that interesting? That Paul's desire is to encourage a body of believers in the midst of his own suffering. And furthermore, isn't it in interesting that in instances of suffering, encouragement can be found? Because that's exactly what Paul says here. Pray for me, because I'm in chains. Right? And he says, but Tychicus is going to tell you all about this. Uh, and I'm having him tell you all about this so that you can know how I'm doing. I'm in chains. And so that you can be encouraged. So that you can be encouraged. This is a very specific purpose. I absolutely believe um, that Paul's desire, his greater desire, was not to communicate how he was doing, but was to encourage the believers in Ephesus. And I believe this morning that this report of how he's doing and the encouragement that he desired to go with it, they go hand in hand. But again, as we've noted, that might seem a little odd, right? Because the report is not great. He's suffering unjustly. So, wait a minute, Pastor. You mean that in a situation that is undeserved, where a man is waiting trial, most likely to die. History tells us he did. Okay. We can find encouragement in that. You know, I, I hesitate sometimes um, to use people as examples um, from the body, especially when I don't ask permission to do this, and especially when the individual is back with us this morning. But I trust that she knows my heart, and she'll forgive me. Um, but you know, when we talk about this reality and being encouraged, even in the midst of suffering, um, I, it's hard when she's looking at you. I always, I just think of Marsha. You know, it's been, what, a year and a half, right? She's given me the nod, a year and a half or so since this whole thing started. And if you're not familiar, you know that she had multiple tumors in her chest, and they tried to get them out, and they can't get them out. And then they 
try to do the radiation and the chemo and all these different things and she had all these complications and it was she'd been stuck at home she couldn't have visitors she couldn't come to church and on and on and on and on now i wouldn't say that it's suffering for the cause of christ in the sense that she was in chains but she did suffer for the cause of christ and you know why i would submit that to you this morning because she served through her suffering as an encouragement to the body at Dale Bible Church. You know how many times I heard Marcia complain? Marcia's, I, I would hear her say things like, I sure wish I could be at church. You'd talk to her and she'd say things like, well, I really want to go. The doctor said I probably shouldn't yet, but I kind of want to know, Marcia, you need to wait. I really want to go she'd say things like you know I don't really like having this cancer but if God uses it in my family then I'm okay with it and ultimately if God calls me home I'm okay with that too you see there's a reality that encouragement can be found even in the midst of difficult circumstances not only in the midst of but how encouraging was it for those of you who and she sneaks in and sneaks out and sits in the back and that's by design but if you happen to look up and see her how encouraged were you to see she's smiling you can't see her smile but she's smiling how encouraging was it to see her how encouraging was it to know that she's getting around and she's got strength back that she didn't have a few short months ago you see the reality of our suffering bringing encouragement is that suffering only brings encouragement if we suffer well and the call of the gospel is that that we would suffer well right we would praise god if Marcia overcame her cancer and she grumbled and complained the whole time because she overcame her cancer and that's great and praise the Lord but it's still different right it's different and I don't want to put her on a pedestal and she's gonna be mad at me and I'll have to deal with the ramifications later but sometimes right tell me I'm wrong the best example of something is right here at home I could probably found a story about some person here, there, or other, where, and you think, well, that's great. Another historical figure who lived some superhuman life. No, nope. your neighbors are doing it. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are doing it. They're suffering well. They're exercising the faith that God has given them. And when they do that, it brings encouragement. And so I would ask you this morning, are you encouraged in your life? Are you encouraged by what God is doing in your life? You know, I'm going to tell you right now, I meet so many people who are miserable, and my heart breaks for them. And I, I have to be careful, because you guys know I'm super critical, and that can kind of propel you into being miserable, being grumpy, and being ornery. But I just meet people sometimes, and I just think, you know, it's a whole lot harder to frown than it is to just smile and at least you know act like you don't hate life are you encouraged by what God's doing in your life are you convinced that God is working all things out for your good and for his glory in your life you see in order for both of these questions to be a reality for you you have to realize the emphasis of the individual who is suffering is that they love Jesus Marcia is not superhuman and though she does generally just have a happy demeanor and disposition Marcia didn't grumble and complain and give in to her suffering not because she's superhuman or has a naturally joyful disposition, but because her joy is in Jesus. And no cancer, no tumor, no radiation, and no doctor can take her joy in Jesus from her. Are you encouraged in life? Are you encouraged by who Jesus is and what Jesus has done? And if you're not, I'm going to level with you this morning. It may be because you don't believe it. 
You may know what the scripture says. Jesus died on a cross for my sins. You and I both know as sure as I'm standing and you're sitting that that is not faith. That's a cognitive regurgitation of information. And the cognitive regurgitation of information will not produce a faith that allows you to suffer well. Do you love Jesus? How often do I ask that question from this pulpit? Do you love Jesus? If you don't genuinely love Jesus, you will not easily find encouragement in this life. Even if you're not suffering, but especially if you are suffering. You see, you only find this encouragement in your life and in seasons of difficulties in other people's lives when you and they can have a genuine love for Jesus. And if you're unsure this morning, if you genuinely love Jesus, then that's fair. Like, there's a lot of people who say, well, I know what the Bible says, but how do I know if I'm in that place where I just know information? Because we all agree, right? Like, there's some of the smartest people in the world can tell you what the Bible says, but by their own admission, they don't believe it. So just simply knowing what the Bible says is not faith. It doesn't mean that you believe it. And so maybe this morning you're thinking, well, pastor, I know what the Bible says in some regards and in some areas. And I, I know about, you know, Jesus and the, his death and, and resurrection and sin. I, you know, I know these things, but how do I know if I really, how do I know if I really believe them? Well, just examine your priorities and your affections. That'll tell you all you need to know. If you love Jesus, it'll show in your life. It'll show in your priorities. It'll show in where your affections and your attentions go to. I'd ask you this morning, is Christ at the top of your priority list? Before I ask you my next question, I will remind you that that's the only place for him. That's what scripture teaches us. He's either at the top of your priority list or he's not on it. You don't, he don't come in second place. And if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you rejoice that he doesn't come in second place. Because the essence of the gospel is that by faith, we win. So you rejoice that he doesn't come in second place. You know, is he at the top of your priority list? Is he anywhere near the top of your priority? See, God's desire is for his people to be encouraged and built up through their faith in him and through their relationship with other believers, that we would be built up and we would be encouraged. And lastly, quickly, I want you to see verses 23 and 24, the rest for believers. So Paul tells them why he's sending Tychicus, and then in verse 23 says, Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. So Paul finishes his letter outlining the rest for the believer. The rest. And when I say rest, I mean like rest for a weary soul, weary soul where Jesus said, all you who are uh, weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. That's the rest we're talking about this morning. This rest is outlined in Paul's typical triad of blessings, peace, love, and grace. And this is the culmination of all that Paul has exhorted the Ephesians to throughout the course of this letter to the Ephesians. Peace to the brothers, love with faith, grace to those who love Jesus. Paul ends his letter in the same way he opened it. By admonishing the believers in Ephesus to the peace, love, and grace of God. But I want you to understand this morning that he literally, Paul, literally, not me, right? Not being legalistic and saying you need to love Jesus. Like Paul literally in scripture puts the qualifiers there for us. This peace, love, and grace. Peace is for who? The brothers. That's those who are in Christ. Faith from God. Those who are in Christ have faith from God. Those apart from Christ do not have faith in God. Grace 
from God. And who does he say has grace from God? Only those who love Jesus. And so I want you to understand something. If you lack encouragement in your life and you desire some rest, you will find it nowhere other than faith in Jesus Christ. And I'll be willing to say, if you've been trying to find it in other places, you haven't found it yet, and you're still searching. And you will only find peace, grace, and that faith to believe in Christ. You can only find this true rest and peace and grace of God that comes by faith in the resurrection of Jesus, or in the resurrected Jesus, I should say. And we think about this rest, right? What do we know about this faith that Paul admonishes the believers to understand and to grow in? What does Paul tell the Ephesian believers in just the first, I actually put in my notes, the first three chapters alone, but I'm going to narrow it down now. In the first 14 verses of the book of Ephesians, the first 14 verses, Paul talks about spiritual blessings that belong to those who are in Christ. Here's a few of them. They're chosen by God, adopted by God, redeemed to God, forgiven by God. They have an inheritance preserved for them with God, and they have been sealed unto God. This is just the first 14 verses. And the truth is, we could have picked that down and, and made this list way longer. Sometimes we think about this reality of, of, of faith in, in our lives. And we see here this as Paul is teaching and he's reminding these believers of their faith in a resurrected Jesus. And that resurrection, re resurrected Jesus accomplishes all of those things that we just talked about. Being chosen by God, adopted by God, being redeemed to God. Your sins are forgiven by God. You're in relationship with God. And we could keep going. So how does a believer rest in the midst of suffering? How do we find encouragement in the midst of difficulty in our lives it's by focusing on what it is that you profess to have believed in saying you've trusted Jesus. This is why we can say, what are your priorities and affections? They will help you to determine whether or not you really have faith in Jesus. And sometimes, I want to be careful, right? Because I want to say sometimes we can do an assessment, if you want to call it that. And it may not say that we absolutely don't have faith in Jesus, but it may say that we've walked away from that faith. It may say that we need to, you know, deal with the sin in our lives, and as Scripture would call it, we need to repent. And so it's important that we understand that reality this morning as well. I, listen, if you're a genuine believer and you're not seeking to faithfully walk with Jesus, I will flat out tell you, you probably don't have rest in your life. Because the scriptures tell us that God chastises those whom he loves. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'll pray that you'll be miserable until you repent. God's desire is for the fellowship of his people to be sweet and an encouragement and glorifying to him. So many folks in the church are hurting and they are weary. And they lack rest. All while saying, oh, no, I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm a believer in Jesus. And I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not circumstances and situations, okay? It's not a blanket statement, but it is a general, it's a general rule that I can easily make. I'm sorry. I'll just tell you that's a reality, right? If you're a believer in Jesus and your life lacks rest, you're probably not walking with him. You see, Paul never ceased to praise God for his faithfulness to Paul. He never ceased to praise him. Even in the midst of suffering and great difficulty, even knocking on death's door, Paul praised his Savior and sought to see the gospel proclaimed. The truth this morning, as we finish, is that no matter what your circumstances are, God's desire for you 
And the message of the gospel says you can have rest eternally. Doesn't matter what your circumstances are. You can have rest. And the call of the gospel is to see that Christ is worth it, even in your suffering. And I gave you one example in our midst of somebody who believed that. And I never asked her. I never said, Marsha, do you believe Jesus is worth your suffering? You know why I didn't ask her that? Because I didn't have to. I didn't have to. She lived. Her testimony was such that he was worth it. When we see that Christ is where we find our rest, and we seek then that rest in Christ, even in the midst of our suffering, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of uncertainty, we will find rest. And in finding rest, we will be encouraged. This is the end of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Three chapters of theological truth, three chapters of implications for their lives. And out of everything that he would say in what we call six chapters, it wasn't six chapters when he wrote it, but in everything that he would say in six chapters when he finished, he said, I want you to be encouraged. And I want you to be encouraged in the midst of my suffering. And by way from that, we learn and we know that we can be encouraged in the midst of our own suffering. Are you encouraged this morning? You find rest in Christ? I promise you, if you're looking anywhere else, you're not going to find it. Only in Christ do we, find, do we find the rest for our weary souls. Let's pray. God, I thank you today for the rest that's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you today for the finished work at the cross of Calvary. I thank you today, God, for the empty tomb. I thank you today, God, for the promise of victory. I thank you today, God, for rest for the weary soul. I thank you today, God, for encouragement in the midst of difficulty. I thank you today, God, for your faithfulness. This morning, I just pause as we bring this letter to a close. And I pray, God, that it would be information, not just that it would be information, but that it would be information and truths that are implanted deep within our hearts and our minds, and that we would take them with us when we go. And God, may we call to mind who we are in Jesus. God, this morning I do want to pray for one who may be wrestling. Maybe that rest is, is missing in their lives. Maybe that encouragement just is not there. And God, I don't know every situation. I don't know every circumstance, but I'm thankful today, God, that you are the discerner of hearts. And I pray, even as we prepare to close and sing a song where we're invited into the throne room, into your very presence, God, I pray this morning that for the, the individual who may be weary, who may desire rest and is lacking, and I pray, God, that they would heed the call to boldly come because of what Jesus has done. We can never thank you enough, God, for all that you have done for us for all that you have given to us. But God, with our voices and with our lives, it's my prayer that we would try. I pray that you would be glorified as we finish this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Once again, if you're able, please stand with us as we close our service this morning with Boldly I Approach. Into him.
holds my soul eternally. attention this morning and uh, Marsha please forgive me uh, it's funny Aaron and I we talked all week long and when we come to texts like these where you're talking about finding encouragement and suffering everything we t- it always Marsha just kind of always come up and I just say you know what I'm going to use her as an example and I've done it before if you've been here with us then you know that that's not the first time and and um, if you if you don't know Marsha well you're missing out um, but that's all I'll say about Marsha um, so with that said uh, it is my prayer that uh, it is your testimony that you, you, you have rest in Christ. And the uncertainty of life, the anxiety of life and all these things, it is my prayer that you would know what it is to have rest in Christ. And, and I pray that you're encouraged. We come to the end of Ephesians and you gather together as a body and you fellowship with one another. I pray that you find encouragement in that reality. And um, so I do want to just remind you of youth group up here uh, tonight at 530. So that's junior high and high school age. So. I plan on bringing your kids to be a part of that. And uh, again, if you want to go to camp and get registered, you only got to pay half the fee. It's $42.50. Pay that. The church will take care of the rest. I don't know. There's probably other things that you need to be reminded of, but that's what the bulletin's for. So again, just thank you all for your kind attention today. Sam, would you dismiss us in prayer this morning?